from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African and Middle East Division of the Library of Congress and to the Noontime Lecture Series entitled Today's Program of Kings and Cavemen, Museums, Musicology, and the Elite in Egypt under the Monarchy, 19th Century until 1950, featuring Dr. Peter Wang. I'm Joan Weeks, head of the Near East Section and Turkish Specialist. On behalf of all my colleagues, in particular Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, Chief of the Division, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome. And before we get started, however, I'd like to kind of give you a brief overview of the Division and its resources in the hopes that you'll come back and uh, use our collections for your personal research in this fantastic reading room. So our division is comprised of three sections that build and serve the collections to researchers from around the world. We cover over 75 countries in more than two dozen languages. The Africa section includes countries in all of Sub-Saharan Africa. The Hebraic section is responsible for Judaica and Hebraica worldwide. And the Near East section covers all of the Arab countries, including North Africa, Turkey, the Turkic Central Asia, Iran, and Afghanistan, and the Muslims in Western China, Russia, and the Balkans, and the peoples of the Caucasus. So we have a very, very comprehensive scope. Now I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Fauzi Tadros, our Arab World Specialist, to the podium to introduce our speaker. Fauzi? Thank you. Greetings to all. I'm so happy to introduce to you today one of the most known searchers in our reading room because of his frequent visits to use our collection. This is Dr. Peter Wayne. Dr. Wayne is associate professor for the history of the modern Middle East at the University of Maryland at, in College Park. Previously, he taught at Al Khawain University in Morocco and was a fellow of the Center of Modern Oriental Studies in Berlin. He holds a PhD from the University of Bonn, Germany and master's degrees from the University of Oxford, UK, and the University of Heidelberg, Germany. In one of his books, the title is Iraqi Arab Nationalism, Authoritarian, Totalitarian, and the Prophecist Inclination from 1932 to 1941, was published in London in 2006. He studied the dynamics of ideological positioning and radical activism in the context of class and governmental group formation. Dr. Wayne, broader search interests are in the role of nationalism and religion in the transformation of the modern Arab societies. I want to mention that Dr. Wayne spent several days working with a journalist from the Al Hurra TV station on a documentary on the Library of Congress Middle East collections as seen through the eyes of one of its readers. Thank you. <laughs> uh, they also included Cairo office as the major source for the acquisition of the Arabic materials from all over the Arab world. It is an excellent program on the Library of Congress and its Middle Eastern collections. Currently, he is finishing a book-length study about the culture of Arab nationalism. He is the president of the American Academic Research Institute in Iraq. Please join me to welcome Dr. Wayne. So uh, first of all, um, thank you very much for this very warm welcome. I see this uh, talk as a you know, small form of payback for many, many years of, uh, uh, that, I've, that I've worked in this reading room, which uh, has become sort of a scholarly home for me. 
since then. I've, uh, I think this, this uh, collection is probably the best of its kind in the world, and there are so many um, stories that can be told on the basis of the books, the documents, the newspapers and magazines that you find in here that I, I think uh, researchers um, wouldn't even have to travel but could use this universe um, as, a, as a source. It, you know, I don't recommend it that you don't travel, but I think it would be possible. Um, so I'd, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Fauzi Tadros for inviting me. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everyone, the entire staff of the reading room, Mary Jane Deep in, in particular, for many years of uh, um, hospitality, support, and, and friendship. What I'm presenting uh, today is a, a chapter uh, from the new book manuscript, the book that is uh, scheduled to, to come out next year. I'm right now preparing the manuscript for copy editing. The book is about Arab nationalism from a vantage point of cultural history. Um, and uh, I'm choosing this vantage point in order to uh, get away from a conventional approach towards the history of Arab nationalism that is very much focused on politics and the history of ideas. Um, so, uh, what I'm trying to do is to understand, in spite of the political failures that uh, have uh, accompanied the history of Arab nationalism, um, so that Arab, I want to understand how it has created a frame of reference that continues to serve as an identity marker um, for Arabs in the Arab world and worldwide. So, when I talk about Arab nationalism, I'm not uh, talking about or not only talking about pan-Arabism, not only talking about the um, encompassing um, Arab identity or uh, Arab nationalist ideology, I'm also talking about um, other nationalisms that are present in the Arab world and that have an Arab reference with the understanding that people in the Arab world, Arabs today, um, are um, or have, have multiple identities, identify themselves in multiple ways locally, regionally, with the entire Arab world, but also with their religious or, or um, other mixed ethnic identities. So when I'm talking about Egypt today, it is one facet of nationalism, one possibility of nationalism in the Arab East. And also, museology is one way um, to express national identity. It is an elite way, as I, I present it here today. So let me tell you a little bit about the history of this project you know, a, a tale of the field, if you will, a tale from the field. So what you see in this picture here is a picture of the uh, well-known um, Egyptian museum, Cairo Tahrir Square. I myself took this picture uh, around about January 31. The story is, is that I had come to Egypt early in January in 2011 uh, with a project to uh, inquire into um, Egypt's museum landscape. And this uh, project was cut short by the uh, Tahrir Square revolution but I think it's still a wonderful illustration of, the, um, of how museums still play a role uh, today as, as symbols. You see the, the tanks of the Egyptian army on the side and the Egyptian protesters in front of it, protecting, trying to protect um, Egyptian heritage. So um, this is not the museum that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a museum that was founded in Egypt, established in Egypt between uh, 1939 and 1949, the Egyptian, uh, the Museum of Egyptian Civilization, Mathaf al Hadara al Masriya. You know, this, this uh, map here uh, should, should give you um, an idea about the location here. Uh, do I know? I don't know. Can I? Oh, yeah. Can you see that, that, uh, that arrow? Okay. So, what you have here is, is Tahrir Square, nowadays a very well known place. Here is the um, Egyptian museum that I just showed to you, but I'm not going to talk about it. And if you, if you cross uh, the, um, the bridge here, I think it's called uh, Tahrir uh, Bridge today, um, you come to the uh, Gezira Island, and um, in, the, in the, southern, the southern part of the Gezira Island. And in this place here, you see this kind of triangular shape. This is the um, old fairground um, that was um, occupied by the Egyptian Agricultural Society, founded in uh, the late 19th century um, by um, King Abbas uh, the, the second. No, it was not King, Khadiv Abbas the second at the time. And, uh, you know, in the, on this fairground here, you see two buildings, these uh, black uh, 
structures here, and I'm looking especially at this, at this one. And this uh, building is still standing today in Cairo. Um, and if you look very closely, it has these uh, here on, on, the, on the facade, on the front side of this building, it has still the name of the museum written, in both in English and, and, uh, and in Arabic. Um, the um, structure, I think, is quite remarkable. It was built by architect uh, Mustafa Fahmi, who lived from 1886 to 1972, who was uh, the uh, most prominent um, architect of his time, uh, um, renowned to be the uh, introducer of modern architecture in Egypt. And I think the, the combination here of um, Art Deco style with, with Neo Mamluk style is actually quite remarkable. So it's a, I think it's a wonderful building. The museum is no longer in there. The museum is no longer extant, um, I should say. Um, Mustafa Fahmi, uh, for instance, also built the uh, neo pharaonic uh, tomb of um, Sa'ad Sarlul, um, the mausoleum of Sa'ad Sarlul um, in, in Cairo. Um, another site and another perspective, so you see the, the, the building um, that we just saw in the background behind the tree. The other building here in front is uh, the old um, entrance to the fairgrounds, the ticket booth, if you will. And it is, I would say, reminiscent actually of an entrance to an amusement park or an exhibition ground as they exist um, and were very popular in the first half of the, 19th, of the 20th century, late 19th century. And there's you know, a connection between fairs, fairgrounds, and museology that I hope um, I will have time to come back to in the course of my presentation. So um, 2011, I should say that, I haven't finished that, that storyline yet. 2011, my, my research trip was cut short. I went back in 2012, and um, I actually was, was very lucky um, at, you know, it was a very good time for me because I was, I was a fellow of the Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress, so I probably um, was occupying a cubicle right underneath uh, where I'm standing. And uh, I was given leave time from my uh, Kluge Fellowship to spend two weeks in Egypt. So I, and I used these two weeks very well because I went to the um, Egyptian National Library and in, in the, the Egyptian National Archives, and I found a dossier, a stack of documents about the foundation of the Museum of Egyptian Civilization in uh, the archives uh, that had been produced by the um, royal divan of um, King Farouk uh, between 1939 and 1949. So let me now come uh, to, to the actual uh, content, to the actual story that I want to tell today. So why build a or found a civilization museum in Egypt uh, in uh, the mid 20th century, for between 1939 and 1949. The plans to found this museum go back to a memorandum uh, written by the uh, private secretary of uh, King Farouk, um, Hussein Hassani, and uh, a memorandum that, that King Farouk presented to a special committee um, of the Royal Egyptian Agricultural Society in April 1939. And in this uh, memorandum, he outlined a blueprint for a museum of Egyptian civilization that he wanted to see established um, in, the, um, as a, in, a, in a temporary um, experimental fashion at the occasion, on the occasion of the 16th Agriculture and Industry Exhibition that was planned for 1941. The rationale that he presented in this memorandum to, uh, to, to, the, to the committee uh, for the opening of such a museum was that, you know, there were um, and what, what he wrote in this memorandum was that there were um, museums, museums existed in Egypt that were proof for the longevity of Egyptian civilization that went back to the origins of history. But these museums were scattered both locally over Cairo or between uh, various cities in Egypt, um, and they were also scattered thematically. So what Farouk saw was that there would be great merit with regard to Egyptian history and culture in the establishment of a, of a museum that presents the unfolding of Egyptian civilization as a uni, unity in a unified account. The memorandum of April 1939 also proposed a program for the Egyptian Civilization Museum um, that was built on the idea of a linear sequence of eras reaching from prehistory to the so-called Nahda, the awakening of modern Egypt, which um, according to this program, had taken place under Muhammad Ali, King Farouk's um, predecessor, Muhammad Ali the Great, 
and which finished uh, with the contemporary period. In establishing this timeline from ancient history to the dynasty uh, that Muhammad Ali had founded, he followed, uh, Farouk followed a historical paradigm that had been established at the time by the doyen of Egyptian historians of the interwar period, Shafiq Ghurbal. Shafiq Ghurbal, who um, lived from 1894 to 1961 uh, and who had been a, um, a historian trained in England uh, by Arnold Toynbee. So the, the grand narrative of Egyptian history that uh, Shafiq Ghurbal introduced has been called by uh, researchers uh, the so-called founder's paradigm, the idea that uh, Muhammad Ali was the founder of, of modern Egypt, the founder of the Egyptian nation rooted in, uh, in thousands of years of history. Ghurbal um, had been um, charged by uh, Farouk's father, King Fuad, in the 1920s to um, organize uh, the Egyptian Khadivial archive in the Abdin Palace, which is the, um, uh, the uh, basis for today's Egyptian national archives. And he had introduced scientific rigor, he had introduced positivist methodology, usage of primary sources, source critique, uh, to, to the study of these, of these um, archival materials, always with an implicit theory of modernization, progress, um, and uh, a goal the, towards the, the, the um, coming of um, Muhammad Ali's uh, dynasty as the founders of modern Egypt. So the goal of the museum project was, therefore, to create a synthesis of Egyptian history for Egyptian historical consciousness based on the allegedly unique depth of the Egyptian past. This was, as a program, not only a... Um, scholarly program, if you will, but it was also a political program. It was a populist endeavor um, in spite of the top-down approach, in spite of the imposition of an image. So what, uh, what uh, Farouk and what his entourage tried to do was to popularize a hegemonic version of a grand Egyptian narrative with its climax in Muhammad Ali's dynasty. So in order to understand uh, what I'm trying to say here, I'd like to step back for a moment for some conceptual remarks about modern museology. And this is the basis for the, for the uh, framing of my project. Muse museums in general, museums in general uh, always function as teaching tools. They're established, they're founded as teaching tools. I'm talking about the modern museum. The modern museum, which is, um, as it is uh, um, argued in modern museum studies, um, a product of the French Revolution a product of the, of the European popular nation state and the rise of nationalism and imperialism. The museums, museums are part of an apparatus which the modern state uses to shape societies and acceptable social comportment. Museums are also a tool to rewrite and popularize history, national history, but also global history um, along the lines of the European um, civilizational um, mission, mission civilisatrice, based on principles of scholarly and scientific reasons, re sci scholarly and scientific reason, as well as secularism. And these are principles which museums, um, that, that museums, when they were introduced in the 19th century, were supposed to sell uh, to the populace as abstract values. So when we look at institutions such as the Louvre in Paris or the British Museum, we can look at them as institutions, as instruments that define national and global heritage by way of scholarly classification of objects according to criteria defined by, by science. They exhibit original artifacts. It's very important that these are original artifacts, but these original artifacts are taken out of their original context that are reintroduced in a new context, in a, a museum context in which they are ordered according to systems of uh, of classification that are defined by uh, European scientists, which is not to say that they are in any way wrong. It is just a process of gaining control um, over these objects and putting them into a different con context, so an extraction and a reinsertion of, of these objects. So 
um, the definition here, so when we want to put this into an imperialist context, the definition here is that Europeans in this process define and control global heritage as belonging to a world civilization. And of course, by applying scientific principles, scholarly uh, principles, what is proposed, what is suggested, is that the, the um, action that is going on is objective, is timeless, is not part of a, of a certain historical moment, but it is something that, that stands by itself. Um, and it also, but what, what is being derived from that, from that idea in a, in a colonial imperialist context is that Europeans who have the power and the ability to establish these classifications, for instance, also have the right, if not the duty, to protect or abduct artifacts that are defined as belonging to a global heritage to European metropoles, to European museums, in order to protect them. Um, and this is an act, actually, which, when at the height of this process, when, when artifacts were uh, abducted and brought to European museums, also to North America, this, is a, this happens at a time when, in these very countries, European countries, North America, antiquities laws already exist that forbid the uh, removal of national heritage from these very countries or the export of national heritage. Um, this process that I've just described it makes museums who are ordered along scientific um, lines, along scientific disciplines, such as antiquities museums, museums of Egyptology, natural history museums, anthropolo anthropological museums, makes these museums an essential part of a more or less subtle projection of colonial power. It is about staging Western science as universal. It is about saving objects, saving in quotation marks, quotation marks from those who do not or not quite belong to world civilization, i.e. the um, peoples under a colonial control. Another thing that I should say, and this is a remark about the impact of museums, which I can't really talk very much about here, is that museums are also go-to places. These are places that you specifically plan to go to or that you're made to go to. A museum visit is a modern ritual. It is regularized, it has um, it is, it's it's uh, super, supervised behavior takes place in these museums. It's educative, it's an experience, it's supposed to be elevating. Museums thus become temples of secular knowledge, but also temples of Western superiority when I talk about 19th century museums. When I move now to museums in the Middle East, because there are obviously, and there have been museums in the Middle East for a long time, and what you see here is, again, another picture of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, a very a primary example of what I'm going to talk about. Museums in the Middle East um, in the early or in the, in the 19th century start out as Western imports, Western imports. They are squarely placed in local contexts, however. The oldest, the oldest antiquities collections in Egypt, for instance, in Cairo, were opened for European visitors as part of the tourism craze that started in the 19th century, but they were also established for archaeologists, visiting archaeologists um, to study. They were not opened for the local population. That's only an aspect that very slowly and gradually entered um, the um, museum world um, in a place like Egypt. So here's a paradox. According to the theory of the modern museum, as I just laid it out, they were founded in places like Berlin, Paris, London, in order to represent a global community based on shared values. However, they were also placed, in terms of, how, in terms of their rationale, on a trajectory of civilizational development from early high cultures, such as ancient Egyptian culture, via Greece and Rome in antiquity, where we already moved towards Europe, um, and via the Italian Renaissance towards Western modernity, the modern Western nation state. Populations, people of the non-European world in the post-classical period basically had no place in this image of world civilization. So the founders and curators of these museums that were placed in um, uh, countries under imperialist control did not consider native populations as part of the civilization. 
the world civilization they were talking about. Or they consider them as part of it, but that, that they, they, they uh, assumed that they were in a corrupted and degraded state, which they had declined towards since times of past glory. In Egypt, there is a, a number of these museums. The Egyptian Museum in Cairo, there's the Museum for Islamic Art, also in Cairo. There is a Greco-Roman museum in Alexandria, very famous collection too. There is also, as one of the four, what I call classical museums in Egypt, the Coptic Museum in Cairo, which takes on a relatively uh, specific place because it was founded by um, a Copt, by the, by the Coptic community in Cairo as well, but it is very often placed, still grouped with the classical museums um, that had been founded by Europeans because um, the agenda behind the foundation of the Coptic Museum was rather to define the Coptic community as set apart, different from the majority and mainstream of the Egyptian Muslim population. So we have these museums that are placed in an Egyptian context in order to, but not for, for Egyptians to use them or not centrally for Egyptians to use them, but still, you know, they have an impact in the place because as uh, we, we probably all know, 19th century, early 20th century is a time of immense um, intellectual development in, in Egypt in close um, interaction, um, juxtaposition and interaction with um, the powerful uh, Western influence, intellectual influence, political influence, military influence, and so on and so forth. So a period of reform. So um, museology is therefore a bi-directional road. Egyptians appropriate and adapt museology. They take it in, they see its value. They admire it for, uh, for the scientific purity, which are all values that are taking in at the time. So it's local elites who adopt museology and who create different narrative, different narratives and have a, have a goal of founding their, their, own, their own museums, but with a different goal. The goal um, is to move away from the postulated and Europe-centered idea of a world civilization, but they rather want to use museums um, as an instrument of self-assurance self and becoming aware of one's own identity. So in order not to submit under world civilization, they want to formulate a vision of a separate, independent, and essentially different civilization. And this is a process, an intellectual process, that we can observe very closely in the intellectual journals and magazines of uh, Egypt, of the Egyptian intellectual elite the, and the, the middle classes in the first half um, of the 20th century. So what Farouk, what King Farouk uh, tries to do in 1939 is to put himself into a place where he's um, at the forefront, where he's the vanguard of this process in this um, top-down populism that I've already um, alluded to. He, wa he wants to tell a unified storyline to put Egyptian history, Egyptian civilization under Egyptian control with a trajectory leading to the present modern state of Egypt embodied by his own dynasty, embodied by uh, the dynasty of uh, Muhammad Ali, which is very clearly a, legit a legitimizing project, propaganda on behalf of his own position. The case of the Museum of Egyptian Civilization, however, is quite complicated in that regard, because if you want to found a muse museum in Cairo or in Egypt at the time, you need to deal with um, the museum establishment. And a great part of that museum establishment is actually controlled by foreigners, by Frenchmen, by Italians, uh, by Englishmen, um, which is a group that the king has to deal with. So, um, and who have, to be, who have to be consulted and who are very closely intertwined with the palace, palace elite. However, there are also Egyptian nationalists themselves who have themselves become Egyptologists at the time, but who don't have a chance in the late 1930s yet to move up to, to the top position of the museum establishment in Egypt. There are also other kinds of museums that are, had already been created by King Fuad, King Farouk's father, who had, was, had an interest in, in creating this um, representation of modernity in Egypt. So there was a museum um, of um, agriculture, a museum, a railway museum, a, a, a postal museum, and these kinds of museums that had been founded in Cairo already in the 1920s. And 
the directors of these museums were Egyptians who ra ran these museums with a clear nationalist agenda, especially the military museum uh, that was founded uh, in, the, in the second half of the 1930s is an example for this um, uh, nationalist um, agenda in museology. So what we see here is a, um, is a project where there's a competition between Egyptians and foreigners, between Egyptian positions, Egyptian nationalist positions, um, which include Arab nationalist positions, by the way, and uh, the, the imperialist uh, position of the foreigners. What we also see here is, and this is a, this is a sign of the times, what we see here is, is that this is taking place in a context of a, of a discourse that is taking place in the Egyptian intellectual sphere between secular Egyptian intellectuals, upper class, upper middle class intellectuals, who had started to promote um, pharaonicism as a central element of Egyptian nationalism in the 1920s already. So it becomes a very strong secular um, nationalist trend in the way how uh, Egyptian um, nationalists uh, try to identify um, or, or um, define Egyptian identity. And uh, so that's, that's one trend. The other trend is um, the, the new trend of a rather conservative middle class, lower middle class, um, Arab nationalism, Islamism that uh, becomes a very important component of Egyptian public discourse or public discourse in the wider Arab world in the 1930s. You can also see that in, in newspapers and magazines. You also see that in the foundation of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, in, in Egypt. So what the king tries to do is to bring together these, um, these uh, um, various elements, divergent elements, and try to integrate them, reconcile them within one um, narrative, within one storyline that presents Egyptian history from the very beginning, from the origins to the present day. Um, the, uh, so, so the goal here is to get away from the, the museum landscape in Egypt, scatteredly in the museum landscape, where museums are founded along um, the, the established lines of European-defined disciplines, such as Egyptology, such as Islamic art history, such as Greco-Roman um, antiquities. And he wants to create a museum that basically integrates all these elements into one museum to present Egyptian civilization as a whole. So what he wants, what Farouk wants, is a museum of a different kind. And he thus actually alludes to a, uh, to a new museum model that had begun to replace the classical museums in European countries already at the beginning of the 20th century. And here's where the idea of the exhibition comes in that I've alluded to earlier on. So museology, um, research about museums, actually draws a very close link between world exhibitions um, as they take place in European capitals and North American major cities in the 19th century and the creation of a new model of a museum which um, tries to be pedagogical, which tries to be um, educative, which tries to tell a story. So these new museums, as you see them, for instance, in technical museums, you know, the uh, Deutsche Museum in, in Munich is an example for that. Um, and there's a number of, of other museums. So it's, it's these museums where the storyline is more important than scientific classification, where the storyline is more important um, than uh, the um, original object. So what you have in these museums is not necessarily original objects, but you have models, you have maps, you have um, dioramas, which are very popular at the time. You have um, mannequins, you have huge um, setups, staging um, of... Uh, of history, staging of society, staging also of technology. You know, museums where you can, where, where there's actually a proper steam engine in the center of the museum that you can run and these kinds of things. So the, the, uh, the audience of this museum, which becomes more and more also the, the, the working classes, lower classes in, in these societies, are supposed to take in a story in a, in, a, in a simplified way as it is presented by the authorities. And something similar is supposed to happen in this Egyptian Civilization Museum. So what it does is that it puts that this, this Egyptian Civilization Museum following this new kind of museology puts narrative over authenticity. And this is, of course, something which is at odds with how, for instance, the Egyptian Museum, 
is, is uh, organized. If anybody of you has been to the Egyptian Museum, it's actually a wonderful, a splendid example of 19th century museology, where you have objects that are ordered according to the era, um, the, the specific dynasty uh, when, when, where they were founded. You have a room full, full of, of um, funerary objects. You have a room full of toys, you know, which, of course, not put into a context of daily life uh, of people, but they are put in, in huge... Um, um, you know, uh, um, boxes, um, vitrine, glass, glass boxes, they're presented and they're, they're cramped into these boxes and it's very hard actually to identify them. This is classic 19th century museology and this is not what, uh, what King Farouk wants. So the, um, the memorandum, coming back to the memorandum of 1939, says in, that the, uh, the, the museum should focus or should illustrate trajectories of development. It should illustrate causes and consequences, links and connections. It should use models, dioramas, pictures, maps, but maybe also, but not necessarily, origini or original artifacts. So Farouk commissioned the museum makers to present society in all its depth and breadth. That's, um, I'm, I'm paraphrasing the, still paraphrasing the, the memorandum, especially in development of architecture, agriculture, the crafts, and industry in engineering, and quite importantly, also the military. Quite significantly, arts or religion do not come up in his memorandum. What it presupposes is, of course, that there is such a thing as unity and harmony in an identifiably Egyptian civilization. And there's no room in this memorandum for divergent perspective, perspectives. So in the following months, um, the, um, the uh, committee that was charged with the creation of this museum went to work and, was, and tried to, to establish that kind of grand narrative. But the people who were in this committee actually were mostly the directors of the existing museum. So you can imagine that there was, uh, there was on the one hand uh, confusion about what uh, to achieve actually, but on the other hand there was also competition between the different actors in Egypt, Egypt's museum landscape over who would get to lead, who would, who would get um, the most prominent place and as you can imagine, uh, one of the most, you know, all, all these different participants in the committee submitted their own uh, memoranda about the, um, their visions, what they could contribute to the museum. And the most detailed vision came, of course, from the European director of the Egyptian Museum who wanted to foreground um, um, ancient Egypt in this. The second, another one which was quite important was actually the, the uh, memorandum submitted by the director of uh, the military museum because he, he actually came closest probably to what, to what um, Farouk had envisioned because the museum already consisted of you know, mannequins with uniforms, arms, um, um, dioramas, and, and, and so on and so forth. There was, however, also a very mysterious figure um, uh, among the members of the, uh, of the um, committee uh, whose name was uh, Fuad Abdel Malik, who was, the, who was the director of Cairo's Wax Museum. Most of the other uh, directors, especially the ones of the classical museums, um, probably had, had, did not have a lot of respect for such a man. They would have considered him a charlatan because his approach to, to, um, to uh, you know, museology uh, went... Uh, very much count, ran, ran counter to, to their self-perception as scholars. However, his vision was probably closer to the vision of the king than the, one, uh, than the ones of the, of the directors of the classical museums. Abdel Malik had been trained in Paris at the uh, Musée Grévin, one of the most uh, well-known um, wax museums in the world, still exists today. Um, and he... Um, had run his own wax museum in Cairo as a private business since the early 1930s. In his, in his memorandum, he actually, he actually claimed that he was an artist, but also a serious educator in Egyptian history. Um, and he also mentioned that his institution in, at the time in, in Qasr al-Aini Street um, had attracted many members of the royal family who probably enjoyed his, his uh, popular display of Egyptian history. And this is probably how the, the, um, the connection actually came about. The, the fact of the matter is, however, that Abdel Malik soon dropped out of the um, uh, proceedings of the, of the committees and its various, various subcommittees. So he was probably sidelined by uh, the more serious, um, or those who assumed, who perceived themselves as being more serious museum people. Instead, after a while, it was again Shafiq Ghorbal, 
the um, historian that I mentioned before, who took over the lead in uh, the uh, creation of the Museum of Civilization and who proposed um, what I call a linear leitmotif to structure uh, the exhibition, while, however, still maintaining um, maybe a toned down uh, version of the um, spectacle aspect that the king was expecting. Um, still, you know, even though the king had rather asked for, you know, focus on society, crafts, and these kinds of things, uh, he, he reintroduced a um, chronological vision into the um, um, structuring of the museum. So what he suggested was that there should be um, um, divisions of the museum according to the five stages of 7,000 years of history of Egyptian civilization, starting with prehistory, then a pharaonic period, a Greco-Roman period, a Coptic section, an Arab-Ottoman section, and a modern section, which, of course, as a chronology, is very much in line with the founder's paradigm uh, that I had uh, introduced uh, before. At a later stage, actually, the modern period, quite interestingly, was divided again into a period of the Napoleonic invasion, a period of the rule of, of Muhammad Ali, and then a period of the rule of his dynasty, which is quite puzzling because if you think that this is a museum which somehow you have to uh, put into an anti-imperialist context to give such a pride of place to the Napoleonic invasion sounds strange. But in a way, the Napoleonic invasion is a very important marker for uh, Muhammad Ali's dynasty to set itself um, apart from what came before. So there's the Ottoman period, there's the Napoleonic invasion, which is a deep cut according to this vision of Egyptian history, which brings modernity to Egypt. Um, and then afterwards, there's Muhammad Ali, and there's the foundation of the modern nation state. So it, it reinforces the, uh, the founder's paradigm. The, um, what Shafiq Orbal had introduced remains the guideline for the museum until it opens in 1949. The opening or the provisional opening in 1941 does not take place because the exhibition doesn't take place because of the outbreak of World War II. There are new committees, new subcommittees that are founded um, in, that are created in 1942. And the plan after 1942 is to establish already a, um, a permanent version of the museum in uh, the building that I showed you earlier on, the uh, building of the uh, Royal Agricultural Society on uh, the uh, um, exhibition ground in the Gezira Island. The debates in uh, the uh, uh, following, um, in, the, in the minutes of the, of the following deliberations of these committees that I read evolve around details such as specific content of the dioramas that are, that are founded, large frescoes that make up a central part of the um, of the uh, exhibition. It's, it's debates about the artists to be, that are supposed to be commissioned, and all of them have to be Egyptian artists. It's about finances, and so on and so forth. So what the exhibition, as it can be reconstructed today, emphasizes is dynastic history. Um, as we can see in the, uh, in, in the introduction, intro, introduction of the Napoleonic period, as I have um, referred to bef uh, before, and it's um, its, its focus on, with its focus on the founder's paradigm. I want to um, spend a few minutes, coming to the end of my talk, speaking about a few specifics of the exhibition. I don't have a lot of time, because there, is, there are many interesting things that can be said about it, but I will focus on, on one now in particular. And here is actually where the caveman comes in. Some of you may have wondered, what is the title about between kings and cavemen? So um, you have three images of uh, the caveman here, who made who was a centerpiece of the exhibition, and you can um, figure out yourself what the difference between these images is. I'll come back to it. So when the, the visitor, the first, when the visitors after the opening of the museum entered the museum through the grand entrance hall, the first thing he would see was this life-size likeness of a Paleolithic man with a staff in his hand, naked man, exiting from his cave. Um, to open the museum circuit. And of course, museums, as I've said, museums tell a story. There is a circuit that is prescribed. You walk through these exhibitions along a certain line. At least that's how the, the curators of the museum want it. You know, what visitors do is a different story. They might actually contravene um, the, the planned um, itineraries. But nevertheless, the way how the itinerary is set out um, has, has definitely has a meaning. So this is the only statue of this kind in the museum. Otherwise, the museum 
um, consists, consisted, as far as I could reconstruct it from the guidebook, from a guidebook that I could find, um, I think it's actually here in the library, um, in, uh, that was published at, on the occasion of the opening in 1949. So uh, the, the, um, the on, all the other exhibits in the museum are um, small scale dioramas, like shoe boxes, little larger, larger than shoe boxes, with the tiny figures uh, presenting um, episodes from Egyptian history, but also presenting um, you know, the achievements of Egyptian technology, hydroelectric dams, and so on and so forth, when we come to the modern period. Um, so what the circuit, what the placing of the, of the caveman in this position here actually does is to insinuate to the, to the visitor that there is um, a long reach of Egyptian civilization throughout the ages, from the caveman to the glorious dynasty of Mehmed Ali of Muhammad Ali, the founder uh, of, of the dynasty. And what the 1949 guide, guidebook actually said about the, the caveman was that the modern species of men had, a, had appeared to, to the end, toward the end of the Paleolithic, and here I'm, I'm quoting now from, from my own translation. After this, man entered into a new period, which was all innovation, progress, and ascent. Without a doubt, the origins of our new civilization go back to this period called the Neolithic, end of quote. So the foundations for modern civilization and the origins of social and governmental life, and I quote again, prepared the ground for political unity and the unified government in the early pharaonic age. So what we see here is a language of unity, a language of progress, uh, a teleological worldview, if you want. Um, and you know, the, the, uh, the um, caveman therefore plays a central role in the single whole the, the, the holistic narrative that the, that this, uh, the museum wants to uh, present. And an evolutionary in, image of Egyptian civilization on a single trajectory. So in this context, the caveman plays the role of the arch-Egyptian at the origins of glorious Egyptian civilization. In 1947 already, a journalist from the Egyptian intellectual journal, Al-Hilal, I think somewhere up there, um, it was, was given a, a, a tour of the pre-opening tour of, of the museum in, anticipa in, the, in anticipation of the opening. And um, he, he uh, presented the caveman as, I quote, the ancient Egyptian in the prehistoric age, end of quote. So it's a narrative that places Egypt at the center of a vision of civilization marked by a trajectory leading from the origin of the species toward modern man who was capable of commanding nature. He was capable of commanding nature at the beginning. This is why he steps out of the cave to discover his world. And he's capable of commanding nature at the end, in the present time. But here it's hydroelectric dams. Here it's modern agriculture and so on that, um, that represent his command over nature. So in a metaphorical sense, the Neanderthals emergence out of his cave uh, thus depicts a coming of age moment. And I would compare it um, to uh, the uh, famous scene from Stanley Kubrick's film uh, 2001, the Dawn of Man sequence um, at the beginning. And a man, he definitely was. So what's remarkable is the stark nudity of this, uh, of this figure. And the first available image, which is on the, on the left, um, from, um, oh, it's, it's probably actually 19... I'm not sure if I get the, the, the years right here. I think the, the first image might actually, might actually have been from 1947. So on the first image here, um, he is uh, presented, and it's published in Al-Hilal, is presented in, in uh, full frontal nudity, even exposing his genitals. Two years later, same um, journal um, publishes an image of the caveman, flipping, uh, flipping the image and also covering his private parts with a staff. And then finally, in the museum catalog, published in 1949, he's given a loincloth, whatever that means. I mean, I don't really have a, a, a clear um, explanation. I don't have any records uh, why this was done, but it was probably considered to be um, too much for a, a middle-class, projected middle-class audience of this, uh, this, museum's, of this museum to, to bear to see. Um, such full frontal nudity. And there might be um, some sort of um, discourse underneath that still has to be discovered about, about moralities and, and science and these kinds of things. So the exhibition, and I'm, I'm coming to the end now, the exhibition thus opened the narrative of the museum in brute masculinity, 
as a token for the understanding of the museum makers that history was driven by male dominance and principles, which also explains the prominent position of war and conquest, hunting and seafaring, building, trading, and the politics of power in the museum, as well as science and technology. All of these um, were considered male undertakings and, play, and to dominate the, the uh, visual representation of the museum. The only other, the only uh, place actually where you see um, women in the, in the museum is a, is a fresco in the Ottoman history section and quite uh, typically the representation here is that of a feast in the harem where, uh, where women take a, a sexualized, orientalized position here in the museum. So um, coming to the end, let me very briefly conclude. The museum, as I presented, is an example of the negotiation that is involved in the formulation of, a grant, of grant narratives and how they are to be made popular. So it is about the creation of hegemonic versions in a power play, balancing Egyptian versus Arab identities and um, balancing imperialist interests with Egyptian uh, local nationalist interests. What is interesting is actually the longevity of this narrative. You can find it today with the exception of the, of the dynastic reference, the same idea about a, an organic um, trajectory and evolution towards modernity, the teleological image of, of Egyptian history still exists um, in Egyptian school books today. So thank you very much. Well, <laughs> well time for the question and answers. No, 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 Shama, Shama. Oh, Shama. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I saw. Yeah, there's a little, <laughs> there's a little democratic mark. <laughs> okay. I thought it was No, 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 no. Definitely, definitely. I think it is, uh, it is an attempt to place the, 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 the monarchy um, centrally in a broad uh, context of uh, debates during the time about what constitutes Egyptianness. And it takes um, elements from many sides in that regard. It takes elements from um, Arab identity, um, it takes parts from Arab identity, you know, for instance, by promoting uh, a vision of uh, Salah Eddin as the protector of Palestine at the time. So there are, there are um, um, dioramas that present battles in Palestine, you know, stretching out into the Arab lands. There is, a, there is, a, a, uh, there is an element of, um, of uh, um, you know, Obviously, the Egyptianists play, plays a very important uh, part in there. There is an emphasis on Islamic institutions in the Islamic part, you know, with madrasas and so on and so forth. So it tries, it tries to combine all these elements into one single um, um, story about Egyptianness. And the climax of the story is the coming of, of Muhammad Ali's dynasty. So it's a legitimizing um, effort, but it is also an effort to participate in the debates that are going on at the time, so that Egyptians can identify with it. They visit it, you know, the people who read Al-Hilal, Arisala, all those, those magazines at the time, and read about these, 
the, these deliberations by Egyptian historians, Egyptian intellectuals about uh, you know, where Egypt is placed, how, what the role Egypt plays in the broader Arab world. So all of this um, comes into, uh, into some sort of visual representation in this museum. And of course, it's not in any way controversial in this museum. It's not a juxtaposition of different positions. It's not a debate. It is one um, line, narrative line that is suggested here. So um, objects don't play a role. It's about institutions. And institutions are institutions of learning and education. So we can place them in a, uh, in a, uh, in a, con in a context of development and improvement. Uh, and, and that's how it is integrated into the story. Religion as such, as a, as a civilizational achievement, does not play a role. So it is a f superficial contextualization, obviously. You know. And it, it probably won't, it, it doesn't cater towards, uh, uh, towards um, Islamists. It doesn't cater to people who are interested in a, in a different vision of um, Islamic identity at the time. It's more a bourgeois conservative identification with the civilizational achievement. That's what I would say. The Copts are actually an interesting, play an interesting part in this because you know, there is a section, a separate section on the Copts as part of Egyptian civilization, but they're somehow placed chronologically between um, the Greco-Roman period and the Islamic period, which is actually in a way reflecting uh, the uh, perception or what, what Copts in Egypt themselves try to propose as their position in Egyptian uh, society, the missing link between Greco-Roman and the Islamic period. But on the other hand, you know, there's no such thing as, an, as a beginning and as an, 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 an end to Coptic civilization as a period in Egyptian history because it is also you know, very present at the time and the Copts want to present themselves as present as part of Egyptian civilization. So the way how they're presented is actually that there are images and models of monasteries, there are icons that are exhibited, but not really, you know, they're, they're not being integrated properly into a historical um, chronological line here. And that reflects very much, I think, the uh, problematic placing of the Coptic community at the time. I really enjoyed your uh, using museology as the But who was really the intended audience? Was it the average Egyptian? Was it a certain class within Egyptian mm -hmm. society? Or um, was it open to all? Or was it outsiders to come and view Egyptian civilization. Um, because as you mentioned earlier, yeah. I mean, other museums were not really intended for the yeah. So by the time, um, museums were open to everybody, I would say. Right by this time, especially the Civilization Museum was open to everybody. It's very difficult, it's a very difficult exercise in, in uh, this kind of research to actually reconstruct the audience of, of such a museum. I can um, deduct that the audience, you know, by the kinds of stories that are being told, is, is the audience is probably the same as the one that would have read newspapers, magazines, and journals because the stories that you read in, in these magazines are reproduced in the museum. So there is a certain focus on an Egyptian educated uh, middle class in the museum. The only way for me to tell um, something about the audience is actually uh, by looking, and that's what I've done, by looking at the opening of the museum in the context of the uh, sixth uh, agricultural and industrial exhibition that takes place in 1949. Originally it had been supposed to take place in 1941, it actually takes place in 1949. And the museum is part of the, um, of the uh, exhibition circuit. So people visit the museum and then they visit all the rest of the exhibition. And there are, there are numbers, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who visit that, that exhibition. Um, they pay an entrance fee for the exhibition which also gives them access to the museum. So there's definitely a broad acceptance of the museum. But 
I don't have any more detail. I didn't find any, any statistics or anything in the Egyptian archives about, about visitors. No, no, not that I can tell. I mean, it's covered broadly in the Egyptian press yeah, at the time. From years before the opening and then the opening in itself, it, it's covered very broadly. It's, it actually, it's actually mentioned in the New York Times when it opens. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Not there anymore. I don't remember it much from the 70s. But it's, uh, but, so was it a success, failure? Did it dis uh, disappear with the monarchy? Uh, so that's an interesting question, and I have only um, uh, unsatisfactory answers for that, because the documentation that I have ends with the opening. You can trace it somehow. You can trace it, for instance. You know, one way for me to trace it was actually I mean, I cheated a little bit because I, was, I looked for it in travel guides, so in European travel guides. And they do mention it. They continue to mention it from you know, the time of its opening through the 1950s until I think the last mentioning was in the early 1990s. But I suppose that this was already outdated by the time. I don't think it was still open in the early 90s. When you read about it in travel guides from the 19... You know, the early travel guides presented as a cutting-edge uh, museum, uh, you know, enjoyable, um, fun to visit and stuff. In the 1970s, it's, it starts to be presented as outdated, somehow um, olden days. And uh, it also, um, and you say, you ask about the, the, the changes that come with the disappearance of the, of the monarchy. Obviously, the, 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 the focus on the monarchy disappears. But the interesting thing is, is that under Nasser, after 1952, um, he has no problem with um, endorsing the, 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 the narrative um, altogether except for the last, last part which focuses on the, on the monarchy. So that part continues. You can, you can tell that uh, by the um, changing um, usage of parts of the museum. So this front part of the museum continues to be used for the Museum of Egyptian, uh, Egyptian uh, Civilization. You see these, uh, the, the dome here, the dome structure here. And I'm not entirely sure because the, the guidebook doesn't make it clear and they don't have any floor plans of the museum, unfortunately. But this stone part was, I think, where the exhibition about the current dynasty was, where there were, there were statues of the king and so on and so, on and so forth. This part later on um, hosts a, a collection of modern art and it later on hosts the uh, carriage museum, the Egyptian carriage museum, which is a clear sign that anything, the, you know, that hall about the dynasty had been removed by the time. But as I said, you know, the story in itself, the storyline, the narrative line is perfectly acceptable until today to most Egyptians. Were there any other such uh, exhibits anywhere else in the Middle East? Yep. Well, you can see a, a parallel between the way how this museum is construed and military museums. So if you know the uh, Egyptian military or war museum today on the, on the citadel, which is open still, and, uh, in contrast to this one, it follows a similar argumentative line, you know, focusing on the development of Egyptian military, but it still draws this, this long trajectory from the origins of time to, to the present day in terms of presenting Egyptian military prowess and using the same kinds of tools. You know. I, actually, I actually think, I'm not, I can't prove it, but I think that some of the material that was in, the, in this museum actually went to the, to the military museum because it's, uh, it makes sense, you know? but I can't prove it. So there are all these dioramas, there are these, these mannequins, there are these maps and, 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 uh, and paintings. And you see this kind of military museum also in other parts of the Middle East. That's what I'm trying to say. So the idea of presenting a, a uh, homogeneous narrative line is something that is definitely pervasive. You see it in European museums, sure. European history museums, you know? Uh, or here, you know? You can, you can see that here, too. Mm -hmm. well, thank you so much for this interesting information. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.